in terms of Migrant Watch, we're using open source data to infer locations of people at risk at sea. It'll be something like 25 nautical mile radius, but but better than a better than a thumb on a map. And that that really is for the first step is about giving the right people with the right tools the information they need to go and do really what they want and what they're setting out to do, um, rather than trying to get a ruddy great big oil tanker to look for for a dinghy. Sometimes you meet people in life who just inspire you. Tom O'Sullivan is an ex-armed forces entrepreneur with a wealth of life experience and life lessons that have really shaped a remarkable individual. Following a profound conversation with a trusted analyst, Tom identified a significant issue with immigrants facing perilous conditions at sea, often with fatal consequences. Leveraging his knowledge of geospatial technology, Tom and his team are on a mission using public data sources to track the whereabouts of vulnerable and desperate people on these treacherous journeys and ultimately saving lives in the process. Tom also candidly shares how he achieves balance in his life, incorporating practices like box breathing, visualization, meditation, and drawing inspiration from his love of philosophy. We also delve into the personal sacrifices Tom has made in his entrepreneurial journey, adding a profound layer of credence to the timeless mantra of everything happens for a reason. Tom is a super authentic individual. There was so much emotion and meaning in this conversation. I'm sure some of the things that we cover will resonate with many people. This is Tom O'Sullivan. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the Tech Leaders podcast. How are you today in sunny Devon? Yeah, very well, thanks, Gareth. And, and thank you very much for having me on your podcast. Absolutely. We were thrilled to get you on. I was really excited about this one for a number of reasons, which we'll, we'll unpack in due course. But let's start with the question we always start with. What does good leadership mean to you, Tom? I think for me, mainly it's about ownership, both of your responsibility and of your failures. If you're bringing a group of people together, you should be walking the path first, as far as I'm concerned. And that might require some hacking through. Sure. But I think it, it's ownership and, and having humor and humility in the face of the inevitable failures and protecting your guys and girls from that. Very, very good answer. Completely agree. It kind of sounds a lot like leading from the front, yeah? Um, forging the path for the, for the team behind you sort of yeah. thing. And um, being that first guy over the top sort of thing, you know, to give it a military phase. Um, it's actually, yeah. in the military side, obviously you've got a military background, Tom. Does that perceptual leadership, does it come from from that experience? Or where, where does this sort of lead from the front mentality come from? I think there's definitely a lot from the military and finding my style. And I think early in my life, I wasn't very good at communicating what I wanted people to do. So it's far easier, easier to show them. Yeah. And also... When you look behind you and you see a group of guys following you and they're not being forced to, they're either there through curiosity or because yeah. they, they genuinely believe in what you're doing. And, and I think yeah. that that's a style that I've taken with me because I'm comfortable to do everything alone. It's great to have people who are happy to share the journey with me. Yeah. Um, and it, it it's resonated and stuck with me through my life, really. That's great. You know, I think having your peers follow you when they're not being forced to is is, is very rewarding, isn't it? But um, so let's go back to the beginning then, Tom, okay? You joined the army, I believe, in early 2006. Is that right? 0506, yeah. 0506. Talk us through. Let me just ask you the basic question. Why did you join the military? It's something I wrestle with often. <laughs> and I don't think I have a very good answer for myself. From a young age, I was very interested in doing something purposeful. And I wasn't one of those people that knew I wanted to be a doctor or I was never a kid that said I wanted to be an astronaut. I felt purpose when I did purposeful things. I probably couldn't articulate why or what that was. And I just had a natural calling to move in that direction. Uh, and, And that was the beginnings of trying to find out how to get in the army. I understand you you did a couple of tours of Helmand province then. I was in Musakala in 09, so 2009. So Musakala was a contested piece of land 
in Helmand province that was given back, I think, twice before we arrived, and then obviously given back recently. But but subsequent to our, our tour, it was handed back to the Taliban. So you join the military, you obviously get a first your first t- taste of leadership there. Yes, yeah. it shapes you in, in in a very formative time in your of your career. What what lessons did you learn from your military experience that have stood you in good stead in your professional career since that since you left the army? I think that's a very big question. I, I'll, I'll attempt to unpack it yeah. in human terms because I think for me, the lasting lesson has always been that you don't know a person and you probably will never know them very well unless you spend a great deal of time with them. But everybody has similar thoughts, similar worries, and similar concerns in their day-to-day life. And most people have a family, if not husband and wife, children, and the complications and things that that brings as well. And a person isn't a name, a rank, or a number. You've really got to dig into the whole human being. And at that point, it's a privilege. You've got to work at that. And, And so someone's behavior or someone's performance is a condition of their circumstance and their situation. And you can't possibly hope to help somebody or work with somebody unless you can walk the path of trying to understand who they actually are and and what are the things in life that they think are important, sacrosanct, uh, and, and what are their goals, aims, and objectives as a human being. What sort of, like taking business and leadership aside, were there any other life lessons that you kind of took from that experience, Tom, that (laughs) shaped you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, in its rawest form, we're very fragile. Yeah. And that both brings a huge amount of potential anxiety to a person, if you look at it in a fatalistic way. But equally, there's a huge amount of freedom seeing how fleeting life is, how easy it is snuffed out, how... How fragile we are when we think we're, you know, not just bulletproof, but we ignore our health and, and fitness and it's 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 easy to do so. But to have a permanent reminder of how I think for, yeah, how fragile we all are, yeah. um, is a real asset. And and it and life feels like a privilege to me. You know, I'm I'm in a place of in life where I feel like I'm in free time, you know. Yeah, there were lots sure. of early on in my life, there were periods where had the cards been slightly different, I wouldn't be here. And that yeah. It sounds it's it's not some sort of twisted fascination with the circumstance because it it's very easy to become short-sighted about the whole military danger thing. Yeah. We drive cars every day, you know, but we see that risk in a very abstract way. We don't really associate the dangers of road traffic accidents with with driving and but to have something as abstract as combat or situations like that. I mean to give you an example, I sat on a daisy chain IED that someone was trying to set off we could we could hear them trying to set something off yeah and and as as we walked away my bum print was on top of one of the mortar rounds that oh was God. connected to the device wow. so and and you think you know that's a big thing for a human being to sort of try and work out in their head at the time but as as you get older you realize that there's a huge amount of lesson in that and and also there's you know i feel nothing but gratitude for the experience because it's easy to sort of and I don't want to kid you that it's with me every day but but certainly it set a tone of perhaps behavior or, or gr- certainly gratitude for the rest of my life to, to date yeah for sure I, do you know what Tom right I, uh, whenever everyone has periods where they're stressed and they feel you know burnt out or whatever but if you sit down I, I read a lot of stoic content yeah I, I'm a big who's, who's your go-to my go-to Don't say advice. Seneca. Uh, no, it's Marcus Aurelius, actually. Oh, Med- meditations. Meditations, meditations yeah, is yeah. an absolute game changer for me. And I know it's pop it's popular in, in, in the military, isn't it? Well, so it should be. It's like the only self-help book you need, and it's 2,000 yeah. and something years old. It's, it's, un- <laughs> it's unbelievable, isn't it? And I mean, it's, it's yeah, kind of yeah. like I, I see meditations and also Seneca's letters and some of the work of Epictetus as well. It's kind of like yeah. the original self-help help book, isn't it? Yeah. That all hundred percent. It, it kind of, it, it was the, uh, they kind of invented the genre, <laughs> you know, I'm sure it was going yeah. before that as well, but you know, in terms yeah, of the modern yeah. world, I think one thing that stoicism does practice is to, is to consider and think about your own mortality. Okay. Yes. And, but, but when you do that and when you practice that, if you sit down and actually think about it in your, and you're in a stressed state, it de-stresses me more than anything. You know what I mean? When really? you think about your own mortality and you think yeah. about gratitude, 
you know what I mean? It kind of brings your heart rate down almost. It makes you, it puts you in a more reflective mood immediately. And then if you mm. chuck box breathing on top of that, you know what I mean? Yeah. Which is yeah, meditation yeah, yeah, stuff, yeah. obviously. Then, yeah. I mean, it, it is, it, it beats the hell out of any uh, drug you can, you can take, uh, in my experience. How many seconds box breathing are you doing? Seven, I do. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So yeah, just to be, long. just to be clear t- to the listeners, that's seven. S- <laughs> my seconds might not be full seconds, actually. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> not, not one, one yeah. hippopotamus, two yeah. hippopotamus. <laughs> so, so f- for those listeners who are unfamiliar with box breathing, it's basically, uh, breathing in and then pausing for, for in this case, seven seconds, and then uh, obviously then breathing out, but slowing down the, your breath. So it takes seven seconds to, to sort of empty your lungs and then pause in at that state for seven seconds and then going back up and, and just going in that in that box, in that four-pronged box-like way of breathing. Like any conscious breathing, it has an immediate impact on your parasympathetic system yes. so it immediately yeah. brings down your heart rate and and um it's wonderful it's i mean if you if anyone hasn't tried it uh, and i wouldn't suggest you know obviously listeners please don't put yourselves in a stressful situation just to try sure. it out but if you find yourself and you are armed with the the simple tools to do it it's it's incredible you obviously sort of seem to be into this type of stuff then so what what type of me- are you into meditation what kind of, how, how oh do God. you relax and bring your you know uh, stress levels down how do you go about it generally tom i meditate a lot not as much as i should but meditation again was one of those tools that in a earlier life i don't want to say previous life because i talk about my my the phases of my life in iterations you know yeah there were and they all come with their own identity and for me, meditation was something that was never part of that identity initially. Uh, and like lots of tools, when you're scrabbling around to find something and you're desperate, you start using something because it's seemingly the only thing available to you. And meditation was like that. I found myself in a, uh, a, a for a few years in a place where I felt just extremely stressed and anxious for no real reason that yeah. I could tell. And, um, and medica- meditation became a practice a daily practice that showed huge benefits and i'm just talking yeah. like 10 15 minutes a morning it's in, in my life at the time was in total chaos and it was about bringing some order to that and i don't mind chaos you know chaos can be a, there can be huge amounts of opportunity both as a human and yeah. outside of that but when when you start to feel like you're completely out of control and the chaos is being you know, given to you rather than you being a participant in creating it. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Meditation's been brilliant. I, I think routine is one of those things that, whilst both making my peace with the fact that we control so little in our lives, you know, most yeah. of the time when we give ourselves a hard time, which we do all the time, and incidentally, that's a useful tool that I use every single day is identifying when I'm when I'm doing myself down. But yeah. when when we're going through the chaos, if we can identify what we control i find that very settling too because we find that there's not an awful lot we do control yeah we can only really in terms of our conduct we can only control our intention to a point i mean and that's yeah. that's at, at a stretch and our we breathing our, <laughs> yeah we can set our intention on our breathing we, yeah and we can only judge ourselves by that you know yeah. the outcome the effect it involves other people or situations that are completely outside of our grasp yeah. So if we can disconnect the beating ourselves up from not achieving the outcome and, and examining whether the intent was good, then actually there's only one thing to ask. And it's normally, yeah, absolutely, the intention was good. And I think most people might use that. Absolutely. That's that's really, really good point. I think it, it's kind of like the cornerstone or one of the, the main messages from the Stoics is, you know, focus on what you can control and you know don't pay too much attention to what you can't control because what you yeah. can't control is normally the stressor isn't it you never really ever stressed about things you can control yeah. no no <laughs> what do you think of visualization when you've got something to do like you know a presentation a bit of business yeah. event something uh, what, what do you yeah. think about using your mindfulness and your time of meditation to visualize things to, to almost run through it as, a, as an exercise p- before yeah. the event itself is that something is that a tool you've used before yeah yeah absolutely and, and and regularly and in fact i was interested in it a few years ago and i read some papers um which i believe were peer-reviewed um but don't quote me on it ah, okay but they were compelling enough in what they had written and the outcome in in essence they had a 
a, a group of athletes, one, one of the groups they got to train, let's say, leg press once a day for seven weeks. Yeah. And the other group, they did everything else but leg press, but they got them to visualize leg pressing for seven weeks. Um, and they found that actually the control group who had done nothing were, as you'd expect, no better at leg pressing, but the visualization group were significantly higher than expected. Wow. And and I think, you know, it, it's, it's, our brains are powerful things. So, it's, yeah. you know, and I, and I think I can, I can see the logic, but certainly there's a level of comfort, I think, in presentation is a great example because a lot of people yeah. are t for, for good reason by the way terrified of public speaking like i think it's one of the it's a fear worse than death literally yeah. and and for me i can see that it's not about the public speaking it's about a million years ago or whenever when we were living in a tribe of people if we embarrass ourselves and embarrass the tribe we get ostracized we, we basically starve to death or have to fend for ourselves yeah the public speaking is just it's the fear of being embarrassed so i go what are the stressors well not knowing my lines of course how can i can solve that problem that's on me okay what are the other things well i, I don't know if people are going to like it well i can't control that yeah so that's, that's out of your control is that, yeah so yeah uh, and and then but I, again, it may be, I'm going to try and I'm going to try and oversimplify stuff for myself because it makes it more manageable. And, yeah. and then I can feel like at least I'm in, in control of some of that stuff because I think it's natural that we all feel quite stressed out most of the time. It, um, yeah. And it's, it's not, that's it's not, not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. No, is it? Stress no. is good for you in many ways. You just don't want it to take over your operating exactly. system, do you? Because then that's when exactly. you get into problems. Tom, Let's get back on track then. You left the army, 2011. Okay, you pursued a career in security and risk management. Okay, and on a right, you know yeah. a common career path for uh, ex forces people. How did that opportunity come about though? And talk us through your experience of working in that space as a as a con as a as a consultant. Well, like all army officers probably who end up in the security industry, I left having promised I was going to do something other than become a security consultant and then yeah. again life life has a sense of humor but um i left the military so i was i was medically downgraded for hearing loss and as an officer you know i could have stuck around and been training officer or something like that but yeah I, I i took the choice and, and just you know very gratefully said thanks very much and left and at that time again i was in a place where i i didn't really know who i wanted to be and yeah the army had been great at giving me an identity and all of a sudden I wasn't that person anymore and I think I just gravitated towards a group of people who were similar and of course the security industry has a lot of ex-military people in it and again I'm, I'm very grateful it all in my life the things that have come by accident are always where the gold is in terms of experience and for me I left during the Arab Spring and I went over to Libya Somaliland I traveled all across Africa, oh, wow. um, and I just saw some incredible places and met some amazing people, and and just had another education. Um, it wasn't formalized military travel to destinations that the military was going to. It was all over the place, on my own, pretty much. It was freedom. It was a privilege, and it felt like a bit of fun as well. But it was completely by accident, really. Someone was good enough to take a punt on me having met me a couple of times and recommended me. And I ended up spending a few years in some super cool places. And then I came back to start a family and ended up resurrecting some old skills and working with a group of people to start a cybersecurity business. Yeah. And from there, found an angel, got our first little bit of funding and moved to some offices in London. All right. And then okay. and, and then blew and then blew my life to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> For the first time. In fact, I don't know if that's true. It might not be the first time. I had this idea that I wanted to be this, I don't know, this tech startup person. I I, I said to you, you know, I, I left the military and, and just lacked any identity at all and was still in yeah. a place where I didn't really know who I wanted to be or what I wanted to do. And happenstance took me on a path of the cybersecurity journey and I bumped into a few people. It sounded like it was a something that would be interesting and, and it had purpose. There were things going on which people needed help with and perhaps lacked the immediate skill set and and as an organization 
we could fill that gap. But fundamentally, it was for me. I think I think I was distracted by the the sort of fake romance of being a founder uh, and, yeah. and, and owning a tech startup and getting funded. Because of course, what the hell did I know about? being a founder and owning a tech startup and getting funded. Um, and we moved to offices in London where every business there was going on the same um, path. And we were talking to Silicon Valley Bank and others who you know, were suggesting what the pitch deck should look like for your Series A and Series B. And yeah. you know, we, we work at the time was being peddled as this amazing... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> this sure. amazing template. The startup culture at the time that I saw anyway was all about getting funded rather than yeah, sure. doing something that you enjoy doing that people would pay money for. It was, again, it was an education for me. My family was living in Cheltenham and I was getting the train into Paddington every day. By the time I got to the office, I was probably already four hours traveling to come to my swanky offices, which cost 10 grand a month. Yeah. which I didn't really know why I was paying for. How many staff did you have? There were three of us. Oh, right. <laughs> you so probably we could were... have been more uh, co- cost efficient than do you think than looking back now. Yeah. Okay. Oh, 100%. And and, and also th- there was a, yeah, there, there were decisions made that I kind of just let get out of control. And, yeah. and I had a crisis. And at that time, I just decided that enough was enough. My wife at the time and I were having real problems. And we had two young kids. I was commuting basically most of the day and missing bedtime every single day. And this was not the life that I wanted to lead. And the work was miserable. The, ev- everything just started to get quite toxic for me. And right. my wife at the time, you know, and I just said, something's got to change. And I asked her what she'd like to do. And she said she'd like to move to Spain. So we moved to Spain. Oh, wow. Okay. Is she Spanish or something? Or was there a reason? No, no, Spain? no. No, I just think it was it was a vision of just getting away, but not yeah. so far that that we wouldn't be completely out of reach for everyone else. Gotcha. Because naturally, I, I'm quite a hermit. Like I would like to go. I would have loved to have gone to Peru or South America and just. I mean, yeah. Colombia. If you've not been, Colombia, Mexico, those countries are filled with some of the most beautiful people in terms of character and humility, and also just beautiful countries yeah and so i would have loved to have gone to south america but we ended up in spain as a as a happy medium yeah and by the way I, i'm 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 either doing something or i'm not so the whole south america thing may seem extreme to, to anyone listening but i mean most of the decisions in my life are either one thing or the other sure. and we went and we went to spain and it accelerated the collapse of my marriage which i think in retrospect is a good thing but it also put me in a place where in essence i had nothing and I turned my back on the business 100%. And I just wanted to be rid of it. And right. so it continues, and I hope it's doing amazingly well. And I'm so glad I left. So, you, Sorry, you set the company up, but then you you left. You passed it on. Yeah. You left it. No, no, I just, I just walked. I just got on a plane with my wife and kids, went to Spain, and left it at that. I just, it, it had become so, so toxic. My life had become so marred by this venture. And yeah. the whole experience around it, and I felt so disconnected with myself. I look back now, and I sometimes have nightmares, thinking if it wasn't, if the situation at the time wasn't that bad, I might have just hung on. Yeah, sure. And and that would have been awful, just sort of hollowed out as a human being, doing something you didn't want to do. Yeah. Um. So I'm so I'm kind of grateful for the the cataclysmic, <laughs> the, uh, period uh, because uh, you know growth is painful and change hurts. Yeah. Um. And you've got to go through it. You've got to shed your skin and, and move on and, and, and learn from it. Yeah, there's a lot to take from, from failure. And I think there's certainly in the UK, we have a culture of avoiding failure. I'm not suggesting that we should all go out and just blow things to pieces, but there's not a lot to lose. Then there's a huge amount to be gained from trying something and, and just going, do you know what? That was the wrong thing to do. Yeah, for sure. From my point of view. Yeah. So you've come back to the UK then. You obviously get back into the security space for a while, and then you decide to to set up your own your own company again. Essentially, yeah. go through it all, well, not through it all again, <laughs> but you're armed with so much more knowledge and experience now, Tom, that you you can go into this with your eyes wide open. Was that how you were feeling about it? Tell us how Animus Bites come about. Well, like we said before we started recording, life has a sense of humor, and, and actually, I'd promised never to start a business ever again. I, I quite fancied just pursuing my art. So I, I paint and 
I do 3D art and other bits and pieces. But I came back and someone asked for some help with a project and I gladly started to help them out as a contractor. And the project was software development. And as the conversation grew, their customer looked like they needed a more formal way of us delivering it. And Animus kind of happened through my intention to do a good thing rather than bootstrap something and to really formalize the renaissance as I saw it whilst giggling about the fact that I'd you know, obviously gone against my promise to myself that I'd never start a business. But I think that's life. It, it was, it felt natural. And, and, and as you kind of alluded it, it gave me an opportunity to have a hard line and, and some defendable things that I'm not going to do. And I'm not going to borrow money to build a business because I think that's the wrong path for me. It doesn't yeah. mean it's the wrong path for anybody else. But sure. certainly, it gave me a far better idea and structure to coming back into it. How do you manage your balance in your life now then? No, be, having gone through all this experience, you, obviously I know you, you, you're into meditation and things like that, but how are you managing your work-life balance right now as an entrepreneur with ambition? I don't want to sound contrary, but the way I would answer that question normally would be to say, and it might sound offhand and flippant, but to say that I have a life life, you know, there's no work life because firstly, like as we've established, I get, I get up pretty early. So my, my wife is a wonderful human being firstly, but secondly, she gets up at a normal person time. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm awake from three in the morning oh my and God. That, I love no, <laughs> between three and four, but yeah. I love that time. It's precious to me. I, I'm at my yeah. most creative. And I also have something in me where when other people are, are awake, I'm concerned about you know being attentive and making sure that I'm poised to help with something, whether it be in the home or, or with, with projects or, or applications that we're making. You know, I, I want to be available to people. I know no one's crazy enough, unless they're overseas, no one's crazy enough to be up at that time. It's my time. It's kind of, it's gratuitously selfish in that way so how do i manage the work well i do it all before anyone wakes up and then and then the work becomes a conversation because at about nine or ten that's when the email conversations start and then phone calls and things like that so so my day very much like today the waking hours for normal people are spent talking to me sure if i want to get stuff done i've already done that or i finished at 7 30 and i'm going to pick it up tomorrow Okay, I want to talk about the technology element, about uh, especially about Animus Bytes. I understand uh, you build operational intelligence solutions, leveraging things like AI and machine learning. How have you found that from a technology st engineering standpoint? What, what challenges um, have you had to, to overcome to, to build the solution that you want to build? I think in all things, understanding the problem is critical. And I think yeah. for me, finding a person who really understands the problem that we're trying to solve is the hardest thing. In terms of Migrant Watch, we're using open source data to infer locations of people at risk at sea. In, in, in that context, there are lots of analysts around the world trying to do a similar thing, perhaps mandrolically or perhaps with enhanced tech that, that helps them do that. I'm not necessarily trying to automate it end to end, but certainly from one of my trite sayings you know if you're doing something three times yourself automate it it's it's about taking away the laborious mandrolic work and letting people like analysts do what they're good at and analyze yeah. data structured data that's presented to them in the way that they can interpret and infer stuff um to the best of their ability sure. so i'm i'm all about finding problems and the code's not an issue the code's just lego but it's got to tell a story, and that's, that story is driven by finding someone who can articulate a problem effectively so that we can come back at them with a solution that hopefully covers off the outcome or outputs that they're requesting in their, in their problem statement. Yeah, sure. So what kind of organizations do you build these solutions for then? Who is your, who is your core customer? Well, Migrant Watch for us, our core customers are NGOs. So non-government organization, NGO. Non-governmental yeah. organizations. Yeah, sure. And, and charities. So, so for example, Medicine Sans Frontier, we've not approached them yet 
but we will. And I would very much like something like Migrant Watch to be something we would just do because if they find it useful, then tick, you know. Yeah. We we have we have um private businesses who are engaging us in bespoke software builds and Migrant Watch for us could be something philanthropic that we would gladly see used. So when we start to approach organizations like that to join the the alpha and then beta testing, it would be nice to just see it have an impact, have an effect. You know, what a what a cool thing to think that at a desk you can create something that potentially might might impact the saving of life. We all have, have heard on the you know in the media about the issues around um, illegal immigration coming across the you know boats of people coming across the channel some horror yep. stories absolutely hor- like horrific stories of people drowning and things like that um, how much of a problem is this tom how many people are floating around the mediterranean and, and the english channel uh, trying to get into places like the uk how much of a problem is there to solve well how many more than there should be firstly for us at the moment we're focusing just on the mediterranean so when we do scale yeah, we've, we've proved the concept with a user, an NGO who will have been on the alpha and beta trials and who confirms that it works for them in their workflow. Right. At that point, we can we can scale what we're doing to to really wherever wherever they want the effect. What I mean by how much of a problem is it? How many how many people are dying as a result of us, you know, not, you know, of the, these 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 trips happening across yeah, yeah. stretches of water. I'm um, I'm assuming uh, you track these boats, whatever the, these, in some cases, rubber, you know, sort of uh, well, very, very most, primitive equipment. Cases. Yeah, yeah. In most cases, so how do you track them? We're inferring locations through social media chatter and other communication oh, chatter. Oh wow! Okay, I understand. The simple solution would be to, to get live satellite data. Yeah, but satellites satellites are really expensive. Even though the even though the costs have come down enormously. Yeah. So trying to solve the problem in a way that makes it less costly, so that we can prove something, and then if we do introduce satellite photographs and imagery, it enhances the already working thing. If you see what I mean. Yeah. We're we're inferring through models that we've we've trained. We're inferring locations because of chatter and social media descriptions but back right. to your, your first question how many so pre-christmas people traffickers and this is just one instance people traffickers had dragged a rubber dinghy of about 30 people out into the shipping lanes which is their modus operandi because then they get picked up and someone has to deal with them oh. and i think it was at night and they were spotted and a large tanker commercial vessel which when you think compared to a rubber dinghy it's probably you know ten meters above them, like yeah, yeah, gigantic. Yeah, and, and the rubber dinghy's not you know they haven't got lights. And anyway, so lots of these tankers get diverted because there's been a sighting. Yeah, and end up basically driving over the dinghy. Oh my god! And that that's one that's one event from last year. You know, wow. um, and so the intention is that people like Maison Sans Frontier have their own vessels, which are specialist vessels designed like they are in a lie. They're, they're designed to save people at sea. Yeah. Um, so instead of guilting commercial vessels into looking for rubber dinghies, it's about putting the right vessels on task to go to a place that is, let's face it, it it'll be something like 25 nautical mile radius, but, yeah. but better, than a, better than a thumb on a map. And that, that really is for the first step, is about yeah. giving the right people with the right tools the information they need to go and do really what they want and what they're setting out to do, um, rather than trying to get a ruddy great big oil tanker to look for, sure. for a dinghy. Let me be clear. It's, it's not that the commercial vessels are just driving over them. They're trying yeah, to do course. right, and, and, and they're, 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 they're being diverted to go and help people at sea. Yeah. You know, m- maritime law... And also, you know, as a sailor, you want to know that another sailor is going to come and come and pick you up. Sure. So the 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 esprit de corps, the sort of culture around making sure that vessels do go and look if they've been told someone's around, yeah. is wonder- wonderful. Um, it's about you know, it's about the scale of of those vessels looking for something that's just a rubber dinghy. How do they get this intelligence currently? You know, without your product, you know, is it just a case of just looking for it now? Or, you know, are you doing something above and beyond what 
you know, th- there's no way of them finding out in addition to your product pretty much then, is there? Oh, no, there is. There is absolutely. So I think most of these boats will have people on with phones. And so yeah. if they're still within reach of a, a mobile phone mast, they'll call someone like Alarm Phone, who are a, a tweet, um, a Twitter channel, who yeah. work work solely to try and get migrants aid who are in need of it. So they're a Twitter user or organization who spend their resources trying to hook up migrants with people who can help them. So what prompted you to develop this product? Was there a moment where you went, right, we've got to work on this problem? Yeah, absolutely. I was approached by an analyst who described their workflow in trying to do exactly what Migrant Watch does. And they described to me how, in essence, they were mandrolically watching and receiving data and then having to wade through it and then trying to trying to work out what the references from the data meant yeah and then act on it and so the process you know from flash to bang could take hours e- even if you know even if they had the best information possible yeah it was a real awakening for me i think to realize that at, at a at a large scale that was that was currently the solution i spent my weekend building a proof of concept and, and came back to them on Monday. Oh wow! Okay. And well, said, how's that? <laughs> <laughs> Good God! I bet better. That was, <laughs> I bet that was a long weekend. I, d- I don't want to say it's a privilege because it makes it sort of glorifies the, the devastation that's really happening. But yeah, um, to be, to be given an opportunity to, to to make something that solves a meaningful problem. It's it's yeah, not sure. it's not about it's not it's not finding sofas to sleep on although you know great if you need a sofa to sleep on and you've got you've got an app that does that for you perfect you know i'm not i'm not i'm not doing them down but yeah but you know it's like it's a human a real human problem yeah I mean, sure that's that's what that's what animus by uh, animus bias is about we want to solve real human problems not a lot of people are gonna describe to you the real problem to allow us to build a solution until we built up a long-term relationship and so that's our that's that's our, that's our kind of quest is to find enough people who are engaged with human problems over the world that we can start to make things for to solve things that matter even yeah. if it's just for a small group of people well, I, 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 I'd like it to be significant is it challenging to hire people with this because they're not going to have the same passion as you potentially maybe they are but you know it's, it's unlikely so uh, how, how have, is that a limiting factor for you bringing in the right people to, to, to grow the company with your passion and, and with your vision yeah I think there are lots of ways to scale especially in a place of software development and applications there was a great book written by Laszlo Bock who was the people operations guy for Google when Google were finding it they they I think after like eight years or something they they started to have performance problems and and human resources problems that they could link back to hiring too quickly or bad hires and so they brought in Laszlo Bock who I think is an ex-McKinsey consultant and now runs a company that solely does that and he wrote a book called I think Work Rules and I read this a long time ago, but it really spoke to me because he, he, he laid it out in terms of Google, find someone who's happy in their work and then build up a relationship with them over one to five years. And I think that's, I think it's work rules, but the guy's Laszlo Bock. If you hire someone in a knee jerk way or, or because you're being pressured into it because you're, you know, trying to spin too many plates or, um, whatever you risk watering down not only the character but um the element of purpose um and i can't expect people to come on board and be evangelical about my purpose and i don't want to convince them that it that they should change their beliefs and their ways so i've kind of just got to be the lighthouse for people who feel similarly aligned and who enjoy hearing what I'm saying, and and they'll bring a different flavour, and that's great because I see the world through my lens, and and their lens will only enrich it. But it's about yeah. I so I, I I hope I'm answering your question, but it's about allowing the opportunity, and when it comes along, building a relationship with someone. Um, the other way we do scale is by partnering, and we're yeah, currently sure. finalising negotiations with an organisation who will buy a stake in a subsidiary of Anna's Bytes. And we'll develop software together. 
and, and they're a, so they're a, they're an organization that provides um, security and risk services globally. Ambry, mm. um, they're based in in Hereford. Um, they operate globally, mainly in the maritime sector, but also in all areas of risk management. And we're going on a journey together to develop software that solves yeah. human problems that they come across, um, which is super cool. This episode is brought to you by B Digital UK. B Digital are a trusted partner to leadership teams of technology driven organizations, delivering ROI led solutions across cost optimization and also data and AI adoption. What technology innovation, whether it be AI or anything else, what technology innovation are you most excited about at the moment? I had- my my flippant reply is an English mobile phone network where you can make a call anywhere. That will be <laughs> <laughs> like France. It'd be yeah. nice to be on a train and actually be able to have a phone call. Yeah. <laughs> I think for me, my so as a consumer, I love augmented reality, virtual reality and 3D. Uh, okay. So yeah. I make in my spare time I make kind of quirky 3D videos and um You do three D art, yeah? Yeah, I love. I, I, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, and I'm I'm an absolute evangelist for Blender. I love creating 3D scapes. I mean, sometimes it's crackers, but I'm really interested to see what happens after the screen. And I don't yeah. know whether that makes sense to you, but but when we're not fixed with a monitor somewhere, when we're able to receive oh, I some, see what you mean. Some yeah, visual some visual feedback from something that's not. And I don't mean like glasses because I don't want to wear glasses. Yeah. I, mean, I want to see what the next thing is that we can see and touch and interact with. And I don't think it's going to be minority report style, but uh, that's that's something that I don't think it's five years away and, and maybe it's right. 10 years away. So but, you're talking about hardware that will potentially replace the phone as a medium for how we interact with technology. No, I mean, I mean like, so you've got your LCD monitor or your laptop screen in front of you right now. Yeah. What replaces that? What are we going to look at? Right. So just the visual element of it then. Yeah. Um, what's, what are the surfaces that right. we're interacting with? And how how do we, because, you know, we've gone from flip phones to touchscreen and that touchscreen came quite a long time ago now, but we've, yeah. we've got a sort of improvements on that. They're, they're iterations of that. Yeah. They're not huge improvements. We haven't, you know, what's the thing that's going to be like Apple showing us the touchscreen for the first time. Yeah, I see what you mean. What's the next That's one of interesting. those? Interesting. I mean, it, it, I suppose the contenders at the moment may you know, the, the, what it actually is maybe something that we haven't even thought about yet. But I think yeah. the contenders at the moment, I suppose, are you may, named one the uh, glasses, some sort of visual, yeah, yeah. something that sits around this part because it has to involve your eyes, or maybe maybe it doesn't involve your eyes and it is actually a neural link type. Yeah, yeah, perhaps brain device. <laughs> you can count me out at that point. I'm yeah. not interested. But I think it's. I cool can't think what else it could be, though. How else would we interact with our senses? Well, our I eyes? think that's. But that's that's the, it's the unknown, and, it, and yeah. that's brilliant because for me also to get to that place, we will have gone through the getting rid of the peripherals. We would have stopped keyboards. We would. Have, yeah. Everything's. We'll be in a place where gesturing is natural. We're not going to be teaching kids how to touch type and they won't mm. be at a disadvantage from not being able to touch type. Um, sure. And I know, yeah, you know, voice is excellent. Voice to text has got a lot better and very, very quickly. But yeah, the, the, the interaction with what we, and it's not about replacing the compute hardware necessarily. It's about where does that sit? Yeah. And what are we going to do with the gesturing and, and what's going to happen to the screen? And, and I hope that makes sense. I mean, it's a bit... No, it does. It does. It may be a bit out there, but... I've just thought about another potential one. Do you know, like, uh, it could be something which is, you know, like when you go to a concert and watch Elvis, you know, it's obviously (laughs) a concert from the 1960s. VR Elvis. Yeah, the VR Elvis, the the, the avatar. You watch the avatar. Yeah. But it could be, you know, you could probably have it in your watch or something. You could just create a 3D internet environment anywhere through uh, like a projector type device, probably a watch. It could it could be something like that, couldn't it? That's that's potentially another way we could. Can well, you're going to get a Zuckerberg's going to pick up the red hot phone and give you a call now. He's going to be like, <laughs> he's going to be like, you like could get, you know, Meta, Meta. That's what we're doing. Yeah. yeah, I think the whole the the metaverse thing is, you know, obviously it's that's that's a sort of start of what you're talking about. But you're talking about proper proper projections layered on augmented reality. When it when it's when it feels seamless, yeah, that's that'll be a joy. I think. 100%. When we're really, when we've not that's got a TV hanging on the wall, when we've got a beautiful room that's not 
filled with technology, but is filled with technology. Yeah. When we can kind of have not just projections, but but surfaces that we can interact with touch, when we can view things on ordinary everything and and improve the room perhaps as you're describing by yeah having a video call but the video calls 3d and i'm in my sitting room without having to have some weird little rotating camera pointed at me yeah that's going to be that's something i'm interested in in the future how do you think ai and, and modern technology is potentially going to change the military can i ask you about that? have you ever thought about that what's what's really encouraging firstly if we start to talk about sort of defense technology yeah is that it's a bit like nuclear weapons being a deterrent because everyone's got it. Yeah. There's no competitive advantage, which is good. Yeah, I think, I think so. You know, we, yeah. we, the, the playing field has to be level. Otherwise, if one, if one side is see, – whether or not they want to have kind of provocative intentions, if they're seen to be one-upped in the technology, they become a risk which we can see politicians blow out of all proportion and create an idea in our minds that they either – are threatening us all the time, which makes us anxious and isn't helpful, yeah. or that they're posing an immediate threat to everything and everyone goes into panic and that's not useful. So so first point really that I'm trying to make is that it's great that it's even Stevens, everyone's no one's got a competitive advantage. Yeah. And like cybersecurity, you know, the hackers have got AI as well as the defenders. Yeah. So we're just seeing more advanced things through tooling. I think recruitment, and I would obviously that spans all sectors, but certainly yeah. in the military, I, th- I think recruitment is something that and massively recruitment and training. Yeah, absolutely, and and for the better, you know. Yeah, aces aces in their places. Do you have any thoughts on how it's going to have an effect, whether it be negative or positive, on the jobs market and employment generally? You know, there's this fear mongering that we're going to be replaced by robots yeah, yeah. and things. Yeah, the optimists sort of say, well, it's just another evolution of the labour market, and we will just change yeah. what we. What you know, the jobs will change. They'll just modernize, like they did in the industrial revolution, like they did in the digital revolution. It's just the next phase. Do you have any thoughts on this topic at all, Tom? Yeah, I do. And and, and again, perhaps they're. I don't think they're out there. I think on the subject of universal basic income, human beings won't get out out of each other's way to allow that to come through. I think it's a brilliant thing. I, I for, on, on the if if we imagine how many brilliant scientists and doctors and any other trade we haven't got because somebody couldn't afford to put their children through university or the pressure was too much with fees. It, you know, it, can you imagine a world where unfettered you'd have access to education without having to pay for it and it would be of a standard that was worth paying for through yeah. sharing some cash about? Yeah. That's a bit off off, off message, but... No, I, I think I, I, I get you. I get what you're saying, yeah. I, I was chatting to a journalist the other day and, and for me, it's I, I feel like we're in danger of being wrapped up in not just a scaremongery. I think if your job is sending emails, yeah, you know there are, and we've all worked for people who's who just flick one email from their inbox to your inbox. They're going to get replaced, and I think it's that's brilliant. <laughs> and and uh, because we could, I mean, if, if someone's got to tell the model, uh, presumably how to react to certain levels of emails, that but and hopefully that person will go on to do something that they feel is more meaningful and enriching in their lives because yeah. that is not it. Sure. But I think we're we're at a place where the scaremongery for me is around the legislation of AI. And I think uh, okay. from my point of view, it's, and I don't want to be too cynical about this, but it strikes me that the quickest way to raise the profile of an organization is to go and seek counsel with judges and say, we need to be regulated. This is so dangerous. This is so dangerous. Please regulate us, you know? I mean, that's yeah. a brilliant, brilliant move of marketing. I mean, it's, you know, chat GPT, great tool for the consumer. Open AI, they're trying to make some cash. And that's, I'm not against that in the slightest. But yeah. I think we're going to see a lot of pseudo scaremongery around the legislation of AI because of the potential dangers without having too much substance behind the claims. And right impenetrable arguments about why that is because someone will have hammed up the technical wind over it i I don't think i don't think that because all over the world the technology levels the playing field you know if we either have it or we don't if one organization does they've perhaps got it for a little bit of time before 
everyone else gets it anyway, and maybe we get a lesser version. But I think legislation is something that I encourage, but not as a device to make something seem more powerful than it is. And at yeah. the end of the day, until they can em- until they can embody a human form or a robot form, and I know that they've got you know police bots and stuff, but they're basically Daleks. We're not going to be replaced as human beings. We're never going to find you know, and, and maybe this isn't completely off the cards, but certainly for the next few years, I, I doubt that the the empathy, compassion, and the fallibility of being a human being is going to be something that will be on the roadmap of development for AI. Yeah, you know, that's what. We, people want to work with people and talk to people. Yeah. There may be a time where where we can have something echoed back at us that sounds very much like that. And I wouldn't discourage it if it's, again, if it's empowering for a person and a group of people, great. Yeah. But yeah. at this point, yeah, I don't think there's too much to be scared about. It's, it's as you started with, I think it's, a, it's brilliant progress. Yeah, 100% it is. It's the bigger, I think it's, it's, as, it's probably as much of a jump forward as the internet was, I think that's it's going to be that profound, or you know, or something else in the industrial revolution yeah, where, where progress, you know, nothing happens for a long time, and then all of a sudden, an enormous progress happens in a short period of time. I think that's the next two or three years. I think there's going to be an incredible, yeah. and the one thing that does not scare me, Tom, but the one thing that I am mindful of is I think the people who embrace these tools, okay, are going to have such a competitive advantage they will excel way beyond their capability levels. You know what I mean? So if you can embrace the use of ChatGPT and try and really find a way to make the model do much of your job to automate processes and stuff like that, then you will become significantly more productive, significantly more creative than, than your peers. But most people, it'll take them a very long time to utilize these tools. Do you know what I mean? So the early adopters of these tools are going to have, have, have such an opportunity, and entrepreneurs as well. Yeah. And to your other point, I think about if I was advising a relative who is, let's say, in their mid-teens now, I absolutely agree. If I was going, to, if I was giving career advice, I would definitely be telling them to point at something which is less on the clerical administrative side and point yeah. at something which is more like sales or something which has got more of a human element, you know, because you cannot, that will never be replaced, will it? So um, you can't out-human a human. So AI can't really help on that front. But we'll also have the bad actors who will use AI for nefarious purposes, which will make yeah. them infinitely more efficient at being yeah, sure, bad sure. actors, you know, and we'll just have extreme. By the way, on the bad actors front, you know, look at cybersecurity. There's a whole yeah. sector of business who who owe a huge debt of gratitude to hackers. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> uh, for sure. And 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 similarly, you know, in the policing of perhaps you know, look at it at a rudimentary level of Chat GPT plugins. There'll be a group of people who are trained, teaching, learning how to deal with whether it be individual or state sponsored bad AI plugins or actors. Sure. And, um, you know, we're, I, I just think it's, there's an element of harmony to the whole thing and balance. Yeah, absolutely. It, it doesn't strike me that one side wins, you know, in the long term. I think it writes itself. Yeah, it evens up. I'm keen to ask you this, okay? Sitting in your armchair now, looking back, and I know you're still a relatively young man, you've got a long way to go. <laughs> but I hope so. looking back over the course of your career, I want to talk. I want to basically maybe try and talk. To, tune into that guy, uh, early two thousand and six, who joined the army. Okay, that that sort of mm-hmm. fresh faced youngster who didn't really know what was in front of him, but knew he knew he wanted to do something purposeful, as you said. Okay, yeah. What what advice would you give to that guy right now, knowing what you know now? Uh, I I would be <laughs> after slapping him about a bit. <laughs> I would I would say love more and laugh more and get out of your own way and and take more risk cuz do it early before yeah. you've had children and before you get intertwined with responsibilities yeah sure but yeah get out of your own way and to to a point do it for yourself not everyone else you know no one no one knows the inner workings of one another everybody's scared and as i said you know we're monkeys in shoes <laughs> I just, I'd like him. I'd like him in a sort of parental way. I'd like to give him some freedom and take some weight of both obligation and conformity off his shoulders, and just go, just live your life, be who you are, and and love a bit more. 
I love basically. that. Fantastic. Well, no, that's great advice. You mentioned a book earlier. Oh, yeah. Laszlo Bock. Work, work rules. Yeah. yeah I hope he's cool. going to pay me royalties. <laughs> so we'll check that on the uh, on the show notes. What, what other cool. book, and let me just say this caveat, it doesn't have to be a book, or what other piece of content, and it can be anything, it can be a song, it can be a, of a documentary or a movie or whatever. Uh, what piece of content have you been inspired by in the last couple of years? Um, Albert Camus' Myth of Sisyphus saved my life. Oh wow! You sound like a very uh, seasoned reader. You, you, uh, these are quite. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm verging. I'm verging on dyspraxic, so it takes me about three months to read a book. But I oh, love okay. to read. It's it's my it's my guilty pleasure. So yeah, I yeah. love reading. Audible. And I, and I, I love, would recommend mine. But no, uh, but I love I love paper love books. It. Right. Okay. Yeah, and I love holding it, and I love having it on the bookshelf to dive into afterwards. But yeah, but I'm a really slow reader, but I love it. And yes, but Albert Camus, I discovered him like everything else good in my life completely by accident. And uh, he had a profound impact on the way that I look at things to a point where really his book, or it's actually an essay, but The Myth of Sisyphus. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Albert Camus, he's an absurdist philosopher. Absurdism is really around, it's a branch of existentialism. So absurdism is, it's not nihilism, which people portray often as accepting that everything's pointless, so don't bother. Absurdism is about accepting that we're spinning on a rock at a thousand miles an hour which is absurd but to find your own purpose rather than waiting for it to be prescribed to you and he uses sisyphus guy damned to push a rock up a hill for the rest of eternity only to watch it roll back down again as a as a talking point for we often talk about sisyphus and the pointlessness of it all but it's not pointless if sisyphus chooses it if he if he chooses to be the best rock pusher up a hiller and and chooses to make that into a craft it's no longer a punishment it's a challenge and something filled with purpose and it's about perspective and it's about it's a bit like choosing. the fan dance then <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i wouldn't go that far choose to do that's it. ridiculous <laughs> yeah. but but i think no no i understand um, what you mean so yeah that's um I've never come across absurdis- uh, absurdism. Obviously, I know existentialism and nihilism, but um, yeah, I, I, Albert I'm, Camus. Yeah, I would. I recommend diving into some of his stuff. But equally, I love Hemingway, and I, he came to me quite late in life. Yeah. So, for whom the bells toll? I mean, that guy can tell a love story in a way that feels so real with all of the gritty nastiness of real life. You know, the backdrop of the Spanish Civil War. Yeah. Um, he is just, and he, I'm very, I have to be very picky about my authors because it takes me so long to read. Um, so I dump them after a chapter, but, but yeah, Hemingway, Orwell, um, and others, and yeah, Akari, sure. I like a lot, but yeah, Hemingway, he, you can, you can tell that guy, you know, has, has really felt love and loss and, um, and also is quite a worldly guy. Yeah. Um, but really evocative. And, and, and my last would be um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Solzhenitsyn uh, wrote the Gulag Archipelago. He was, a, he was a Russian, decorated Russian officer who ended up in the Gulag um, and won a Nobel Prize in 1970, which he, I think, only picked up in 78 because he was, wasn't able to get it because he was under threat. But he won the Nobel Prize for basically portraying his life and others' lives under the hardship of the Russian communist regime. Um, right. Despite, you know, having... And the gulag is not, you know, prison. The gulag's, like, horrific. That's really, really interesting. Great recommendation. I'm, I'm, I'm loving your interest in philosophy. Uh, I'm not as well, well likewise as, as yourself on, on philosophy. As you know, I, I'm a big fan of Stoicism, but I've not really branched out too much beyond Stoicism, apart from Nietzsche and a little bit of Carl Jung. But uh, I'm, 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 oh, well, I'm Jung, embracing Jung. the journey. I've got a I've got a painting of Carl Jung that I did. He's he oh, really? again, he was he was part of my renaissance and someone who is yeah, just incredible. And and I mean his his books are impenetrably large. Yeah. But his con his concepts are wonderful. And and I love the fact that he, as an understudy of Freud, he took a slightly different take on the human condition and in a slightly kinder way. Yeah, um, sure. But no uh, great great choice. I think um 
young another. We could go on. I'm yeah, sorry. absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And we haven't even talked about Nietzsche, who was a bit I was a big fan of. So that, that's some pretty dark stuff. Yeah, there, but, uh, it is indeed. It is indeed. So um, look, Tom, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on um, again. Well, thank uh, you so much for having me. It's been it's been a fascinating conversation. Um, yeah, and I've really enjoyed it. So thank you for being Likewise. so candid and opening up as well. I think some of the things we've talked about are probably not easy things for you to talk about. Well, hey, look, uh, yeah, I've lived a life of choice. And also I found myself in some places which were not choices. But equally, if anything I say helps one person, then I'd rather be candid uh, so where can people potentially, I, I don't know how much you put yourself out there, Tom, but if people wanted to reach out and and, and find out about certainly Migrant Watch and the other stuff you're going yeah. on with, are you active on any platforms or anywhere? Where can people find you? I mean, head to the website. It's animusbytes.com, bytes with a Y. Yeah. And um, by the way, Animus is a concept of Jung's just to sort of oh, tie okay. that off. So, That's interesting. Um, <laughs> you really are <laughs> living the, the philosophy uh, dream yeah, yeah. then, eh? Oh, 100%. <laughs> so Jung, <laughs> a plug for Jung. Yeah, so animusbytes.com, bites with a Y, and um, I'm on LinkedIn, Tom Sully O'Sullivan. So yeah, come and find me or pick up the phone or drop an email, and I'm I'm there. Brilliant. Just well, don't don't interrupt me between three and six, please. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'll certainly make a note of that. But thanks, thanks so much, Tom, and thanks for coming on the Tech Leaders podcast. Um, I really appreciate it. That was really some conversation, I have to say. We ended up recording far more content than what we needed, but I just enjoyed chatting to Tom. It was undeniably one of the most authentic conversations that we've ever done since the inception of this podcast. Uh, Tom is a an incredibly likable chap who who articulately shares his journey through both challenging and successful times. Uh, there are many highlights I could draw attention to here. Obviously, Tom was very honest and candid about his marriage and also the journey he went on with his, his first startup. And, and squandering money on things which weren't so important and just the sort of ups and downs of entrepreneurship and you know his time in the army and so on and so forth. But I, I thought I'd draw t- attention to the impact of meditation, especially things like box breathing. I thought that was really, really interesting. His perspective on these practices were, was fascinating. Um, and I can't stress enough the value of things of, of, of meditation, especially if you grapple with anxiety and stress. It really is a game changer. Additionally, visualizing things before um, like events, like public speaking events and things like that. If you put your brain through the paces beforehand, you're you're so much better equipped to give it your best shot on the day. It is an absolute game changer, and it, it was really interesting to hear Tom's thoughts uh, thoughts on that. You know, we strive to make these episodes are as, as informative and educational as possible. So I really wanted to underscore the importance of, of, of that part of the, of the conversation. There was lots of other things, though. I mean, it, it was full of value. Tom, Tom was really interesting, a great, great guy. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed uh, having the conversation with Tom. Yeah, thank you so much for downloading. Please don't forget to subscribe. We've got some incredible guests coming in 2024. Uh, but thank you so much for your support. Thank you.